concert because it's Friday end of the day, so I think we all can lay back a bit. <laughs> Um, now, thanks for inviting me. I will first shortly tell about Zwarte Hond uh, on re request from, uh, from you guys, uh, for people who don't know Zwarte Hond or don't know the purchase of Zwarte Hond. And then I will start the story about the floor plan. And be pre pre prepared. It's a bit, a bit of a manifesto. It's a plea for better for floor plans, for more quality. And also for you all as students, like, if you design a floor plan, keep in mind it's about the quality. And, uh, no, I'll tell more later. Um, the Zwarte Hond. Uh, for the ones who don't know the office, it's an office that's in Rotterdam. I'm uh, based in Rotterdam, uh, Groningen and Keulen in Germany. Uh, it's a design office with 120 to 130 uh, people working there. Here you see, uh, see them all in Schier Monacoog. We go there every year for the Christmas party and we party a lot. Um, and Zwarte Hond. Um, Maybe you know it that it has a lot of partners and the idea behind these partners is that uh, they have time next to uh, doing architecture on urbanistic uh, design work that they also have time to do research and uh, do other, other stuff. So out there is one of these outcomes. Now here you see the office and um, yeah, it's, it's an office that's working through a combination of social commitment and craftsmanship. Um, it's yeah, known for the high quality of the projects, but mainly uh, the detailing in it, the craftsmanship that you see also in this image, and projects that are sensitive to their context. This project we did on the Veluwe together with Net, together with Monetnok. Um, this is a project in Groningen, uh, just uh, um, realized, and it's opening in a few weeks. And we are all the time searching for uh, what can we add to the to the city and to. Uh, and also search for contemporary beauty. Um, this is Aliander, a wooden office building I just realized in Amsterdam. Amsterdam. Now, yeah, you can Google it all, but I will tell about floor plans today. But then you see a few uh, projects already. Theater in Rotterdam, five years old now. Uh, Super Hub, a supermarket in uh, Meerstad. Um, quite an interesting uh, wooden construction uh, we made together with a wood builder from uh, a local wood builder and he was really wanting to try this, this big uh, span in the, in the wood construction and uh, no, yeah, it leads lead to quite a cool building. Um, and here you see that we, we have a lot of different projects. Some people always say like Zwarte Hond, it is so wide what you make but that's Part of it is that we really focus on what's best for the context. And in that sense, there is not really one, one strong hand that you read, but it's, it's always it's a search and research from what's fitting there and how can we, uh, can we do that. And the buildings are quite rationalistic, um, but we always focus on details. So for example, on the left image, you see uh, the theater and then we make benches that people, even if you don't buy a ticket, you can look through the window in the theater and you can sit on the theater and uh, we make the building that way part of the public space. Second image, you see a building that's made out of prefab and there together uh, with the builder, we, we search for how can we make these joints and how can we do this in a beautiful way. Yeah. That's half the project I'm currently working on. But that's nice to make all these buildings, but there's a bigger agenda for us as uh, urbanists and architects. Um, and that's uh, inclusivity and climate change. And of course, as an office, uh, we, we think about that, we research about that, uh, we write about that, and the out there is one of the outcomes for it. Out there is a book is in, we make as an office every two or three years about one topic. And this time the topic is uh, the floor plan. And um, I started with a few things. Uh, one was, uh, that, that of course, uh, I don't know, I think almost every architect loves floor plans and is freaking about it. But the bigger thing is that we saw that in, in our office, but also in offices around us, we saw that quite often, I think, yeah, some of you also uh, happen this too, that the client <laughs> comes already to the office, the builder or the developer, and he says like, okay, I want the building. 200 apartments and I know already the floor plan because this is the most efficient and this is what we are going to do. You can design the facade. And then now in the Netherlands we have to build like around 1 million houses and are we going to do it like that? Let's please not. And we had an uh, American investor, uh, he called us and uh, he said like, yeah, the Zwarte Hond, uh, 
I'm so confused. I came to the Netherlands because I thought there is good architecture and now I'm searching uh, in all these buildings and uh, I see all the time the same floor plan. What the fuck are you guys doing in the Netherlands now? And then we thought, okay. <laughs> and uh, as, a, uh, as a pitch for them, uh, you said like, okay, this word holds, if you give me a presentation about why the floor plan is like it is and how you think it should be, you win the competition. Uh, we won it and then we thought, okay, and how we are gonna uh, move on with this and uh, make research. I see that I forgot to introduce myself. I forgot the slide about myself. I don't like that. Uh, my name is Lisa. I think a few of you know me from the Praktijkschaal. I don't know the word here. The practice practice portfolio. Practice portfolio. And from the accent. So since a year I'm sometimes here. I'm architect and urban designer. I studied at the Academy of Rotterdam and I work now for eight years at Zwarte Wond. And next year I will become one of the partners. So uh, yeah. All for you. It can go all quick. In eight years, you can uh, <laughs> you can fly. So uh, go for it. <laughs> okay. Of course, we know we have a housing shortage. Uh, nice. Several newspapers uh, in a row. Um, there's like they still there's a building. Yeah. How do do I say that? Bau in fart. Bau in fart. Now that there are there are many many Inflation. problems. Uh, on the housing market, we have a shortage, but there is also, um, uh, right, let's keep with it, it's a housing shortage. And uh, we are going to build approximately 1 million houses. Then we know that a building can last around for 300 years. So what we all are building now can stay if we build well and we do all good, 300 years. <laughs> that means it's quite a responsibility for what you build. Eh? And now we are having several crises, so there's a climate crisis, there's a housing shortage, there's inflation, inclusive, uh, inclusive, inclusivity crisis, there's a war, there's a building cost, there's energy problem. So there's a lot happening outside. So that also means if you think about what we build is staying there for 300 years, we cannot buy and we cannot build anything anymore. We have to think about what we do. So what are we going to build? I hope not this. I think this is uh, one of the most standard floor plans uh, project. I must say, I worked on this project. I have been fighting a lot, and at the end, even this little part next to the galerij, where the little bench is to meet your neighbors, it's out. And also, this push-in balcony, it has to go out. Yeah, please, let's not do this. This is, a, this is so minimal. And imagine that you live there, and uh, this is how you how you live. So then, I told already that we had the question from the client, why is this floor plan so boring? This is the little book, I forgot to bring it today, but if you want, you can buy it. It's a little book, is it? Because in this book, uh, we did several things. So we went back into history. I will uh, explain a bit about uh, what we found out there. But we also took interviews with different people in the fields, not, not only architects, but also uh, uh, investor, uh, someone from the housing corporation, uh, uh, and, and anthropologist, which was super interesting. I will tell you a few things we learned from that. Huh? Normal people. Normal people, well, not, a, not architects. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I will start with a little zoom in. Uh, it's thrown by, uh, later it's thrown by Nadia Peoples. She worked then in the office and now she's a super nice illustrator. A super Dutch thing is tunnelen. I think there's nothing so efficient as tunnelen, um, a Dutch building method. And you already see, if you go back into the floor plan I just have shown, that yeah, this tunnel is just uh, setting the boundaries for your floor plan. Then we have this stupid thing as a parking grid that's also that's defining the width of these tunnels. So uh, two cars is 5.4 in the Stallingsgarage. Uh, if you have a uh, public parking, it's uh, three cars, it's 8.1. I think you can all dream it. But uh, that dictates the grid, and this grid dictates the width of your apartment. Now, efficient as it is. Then we have the Bouwbesluit rules. Um, now you, you probably all know the Bouwbesluit, and I think if you're sitting behind your computer and you have this grid, and you have this parking system, and then you have the Bouwbesluit, and then you add these quality norms, and then you add this bone matches. Now then you're already like this if you have that all in your floor plan. But then you forgot to design and um, you forgot to think about quality. And it's really important 
to, to keep in mind that this Baubesluit is defining the minimum, and that Baubesluit is not a quality norm, but it's the minimum that a apartment or a house has to be. So it, it, I, I really, uh, I don't know, I, I think you all uh, have had this moment that you go to a party uh, from a friend or someone you know who lives in a new apartment, and you arrive there, and you enter the front door, and then you see this long hallway with all doors, where is the party? And um, how is this the way we want in the Netherlands to enter our house uh, or to have your guests over? Like, I don't know where the bathroom is, <coughs> the toilet, the, the bedrooms. You can open any door, you cannot, you, you're, it doesn't feel welcoming. And it's uh, like here, it's 8 to 12 percent of the, of the house is a uh, hallway. Uh, that, that's not so nice. Uh, we also see that the satisfaction with current trellings uh, decreases. And um, I don't know how's that for you, but I've heard that many people are designing and then they think like, oh, the standard family, so uh, two persons with two kids that are going to live there and we have to make uh, and, uh, three bedrooms and a living room and we have to all do this. But if you see the numbers, like this um, orange part is a couple without kids, then there's a gray part that's, that are single people, then there's an other gray part that are single people with a kid, and then we have this black part, and the black part is a couple with a kid. So that's just 25% of all people, of all households. So the standard family that we have in mind is just a quarter of everyone that's, that's being housed. And then there is, are also th things changing. Yeah? So um, I think it's super interesting in for example, Amsterdam, the parking norm is super low. Um, where's the guy from the <coughs> municipality? Bram. 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 <laughs> 0.4, 0 0.3, something like that. Uh, that's, uh, that's very good news because then it means that we can handle parking more different. So we can, for example, push it outside the block, not under the apartments, but for example, if you have a building block, we can do it in the heart of the building block. That is not longer dictating this grid. Um, and uh, there are other things changing. For example, oh, how are I going to tell this in English? We have, um, yeah, how do I could say it? From the state and the essence, the the, cape, uh, the electricity hmm. you have to your house. We have a made cost. Made yeah. shaft. Shaft. Yeah, the the things. Well, no, the and these people, they come to your house and they want to read mm -hmm. into what you do. Mm -hmm. So you have to <coughs> put this made cost close to the entrance. But I think almost everyone has a slimmer meter, a smart, they measure it from outside. So why do we have to put that meter cost so close by the entrance door? I think this kind of uh, things we also have to start discussing as architects. So I did it in a project and I can put them now in a wardrobe further in the, in the apartment. If you talk long enough and you discuss long enough, a lot is possible. There, of course there are changes in how we want to live. Uh, changing in, in type of households, uh, households uh, changes in the material, materials. So uh, I think uh, we won't build as much in concrete anymore in a few years, and we will change to other building methods. Um, and uh, a lot of things are changing, and that means also that the floor plan can change if we start discussing about it and uh, try to improve it. How did we come so far? Now we have this timeline in the book. I will do it shortly because you can talk for uh, weeks about this timeline, a lot is in it. The nice thing is that uh, we uh, interviewed several people. So it you know, are people that are super long working in the field, uh, electricians, constructors, builders, uh, no, I told already the anthropologists, the normal people. And we made a, a history. So um, um, we learned a few things from that. But um, yeah, I can do that right now. So for example, if when we had the Second World War, after the Second World War, there was a, a big housing shortage. And uh, people uh, got notes from the municipality like, okay, I see you have a big house, you can share it with someone and uh, uh, make it work. But the other thing uh, after the, that's nice from the houses from the 30s, I think you also know, all know these houses from the 30s with the stained glass, this beautiful de detailing and everything. And uh, I think many people love it and want to live in a house like that. But I think it's quite 
quite fun that um, there's a lot of detailing in this house because labor was super cheap at that moment and materials were scarce. So you treated materials a lot better and uh, you thought like, okay, maybe this material is cheap, but if I add a lot of detail, it, it still looks beautiful. And what we can learn from that right now is that if a house, if you think about this house from the 30s, and um, uh, this house has a certain richness, so for example, with this unsweet doors and the stained glass, people fall in love with the <coughs> house and they care better for the house. And I think that's one of the lessons we can learn from that time. Um, a fun fact is, or uh, uh, years later, when the immense, yeah, when women started to work outside the house, there was a pamphlet from house to house telling like, and also to architects, get rid of these details because it costs a lot of time to clean it and these women need time to work outside the house. So <coughs> make it more minimalistic uh, because then there is time left. Things like this that are uh, changes in society also uh, impact on the floor plan. Of course, hygiene. So uh, when in earlier days, the floor plan was almost uh, like around 1910, almost all area was used. Now, you can imagine people live there with a lot of kids and almost everything was used uh, to live. And nowadays we use like, we have like a bathroom that came into the house, uh, installations, uh, toilets, um, shops, stuff like that. So like 25% of the house is now uh, utility use. So th that are all changes that in society came and we're all pushed into this, uh, into the floor plan. Um, now and of course now here you see around 2000 there came the park and that was really dictating uh, uh, the floor plan and now we are more going to these open floor plans and in this period I'm a bit afraid, I don't know, it might be nice to discuss later, but uh, and with this housing shortage and with this building cost, cost shortage, you hear a lot of uh, rumor from uh, developers and building or builders that say like we have to build cheap and we have to build efficient and as fast as possible. So I'm a bit afraid for the next de decade what's coming there. Um, but if we look back in time, and that's quite a hopeful message if you look back to this timeline, um, many of the crises we had led to innovations. So for example, uh, what I told already, that there was a labor crisis and that, that there was more detailing, uh, but also when there was a housing shortage, uh, there was a for example, uh, Van Eestre started to build in different ways and there was being innovated. Then there was this um, oil crisis and uh, then we started to insulate our houses better because it became very expensive to, to use the heating. Now that's again happening now. So you see that many of the crises has led to innovations. So, now yeah, uh, in short, there's like uh, technical developments, economic developments, and social developments that led that led to changes in how we live. Oh, this I cannot read anymore. So you see there are a few positive things. So comfort increased, um, the use and habits change how we live, and for example, hygiene, uh, privacy changed a lot. Uh, where in earlier days, all the kids were in one room sleeping. Now people feel bad if two kids have to share a room. That's also a big change in how we think and how we do. Emancipation was a big change, and uh, now, what I already said, crisis led to innovation. But we also see a lot of negative developments. <coughs> we point out the part that housing became like an investment. Uh, I think it's very Dutch that we think about a housing career. So you you move from house to house, and every house is bigger. You, yeah, you buy a new house that's bigger than the house before, and you make money with your house. But also houses got uh, bought by <laughs> investors from outside. And uh, someone told me, and I think it's quite a good uh, comparison, that uh, you have these lease cars and uh, they are uh, colored uh, black or gray, and sometimes white. But you don't, yeah, way less cars are red or yellow or uh, different colors, because gray, white, and black are easy to sell after. And you see that also a bit happening in the, in the floor plans and the houses we make. Like, if we make it gray, and safe, it's easier to sell it after than if we make it specific. I don't know if we have to agree with that. I met Peter Barber, an architect from London, he does a lot of uh, public housing and he says like, I only build specific, and if you see his buildings, they are really specific, but super interesting. 
So like, because I know there are specific people who want to live there and want to live there for a very long time. So I make it especially for the specific people. So I think that's also an interesting thing to think about. Now, yeah, it's also good to keep in mind that um, uh, right now the orange part is um, apartments and the black part is row houses and, uh, sorry, 2010 and 2020, the question for housing, the left part, the orange part, is row houses and the right part is, no, sorry, the other way around. It's almost 50-50, so the, the question for apartments is growing and growing. Um, a few lessons we learned uh, in this research is um, we think it's good to uh, think more flexible. So we don't only design a floor plan that's for now, but we design a floor plan that, uh, let's say, has to last for 200 years. So it has to be able to change and, uh, in, in, uh, in, or in uh, decades, let's say, but also during the week, because there are quite many people that, um, that uh, for example, have their kids only in the weekend, and the other part of the week they don't have kids. And or if you imagine that a fa now it's a family and after a few years uh, you're a couple or you divorce, so you have to be able to change your house. And I we think this flexibility is interesting to think. Richer, I told already about it, for example, this uh, details. Uh, um, I, in my house where I lived before, had a beautiful bay window. That's why I liked your project with all bay windows a lot. Because this bay window made for me a connection to the street, and I could look in the street, and I met my neighbors through this bay window, and, and I, you can imagine everything. So this richness that that's, that can be in a floor plan or in an apartment is interesting. Of course, we have to build cleaner. I will show um, an example of that: more compact, because there is not so much land left. Uh, smarter, uh, more longer lasting, uh, more diverse. And we have to stop to stop this cookie cutter housing uh, we are now also focused on, and uh, our society society is much more diverse than the standard family. So uh, a few lessons. Then fun. A few uh, examples. Um, for example, more diverse. Okay, what does it mean to build more diverse? Now this is an example of a project uh, I'm working on in Alkmaar. Uh, it's uh, beneden bovenbonium. A lot of investors don't want that anymore, beneden boven owning it. But here there was a chance, a chance because there was a, a plot and the municipality wanted a green dense area. And um, uh, no, I'm convinced the, the, the investor, like, okay, we can do this beneden boven owning, but then, then we have to think about it really well. So, because he said, people in Alkmaar, they want a, the, a house with a garden and uh, a good connection to this garden. So we made a roof garden. Uh, you see it on top of the, the cars, and we made for the uh, beneden boning, uh, we connected it to the public garden. So if you live uh, here, you have a huge hub, a private garden and public garden, and this apartment has a good balcony and also a connection with the roof garden. So that's an example of how you can build more diverse. Um, this is also a project where the major cast got pushed in, uh, oh, yeah, a cupboard. Um, it means a lot of discussion, a lot of talking, but at the end, I think it's quite interesting to experiment at least with this kind of uh, projects. And here you see an example, and we, we make all these images to convince like the investor, but also to convince um, um, the real estate agents that are asked uh, to advise the investor and to convince the municipality, and to have everyone fall in love a bit with the idea. Here you see an example of this floor plan. And this is interesting, I don't know if you know Glenn Lippens. He's an urbanist from Belgium, he's in Antwerp, and he's um, a postdoc in collective housing. And he's quite sharp in that. So one of the things he says, says is that with compact uh, living, we do something to people. And I said, like, what do you mean we do something to people? And he said, like, yeah, you put people uh, super close to each other, and he says, like, for no, I don't know if I, have, uh, I know I don't totally agree with him, but he says, like, a first choice for people in Belgium is that they have a garden, a, a private house with a garden, and no noise from the neighbors, no people that can see them, a lot of privacy. But uh, not everyone can afford that, so uh, they, they are okay with compact living. Um, and keep that in mind. So if you design an apartment, think about these things, the privacy, the how you have your uh, outdoor space organized, and how you have the collective 
for Bart Smith. Um, I just, uh, I can, uh, yeah, I just about com uh, the compact label. Sorry. So the household size uh, declined uh, compared to 1970. So that's also a thing that's changing. You see it's now quite uh, low, but it will stay as low as it is right now. So it's for, if you see all the households, households, it's uh, average of 2.1 person per apartment or per house, uh, per household. So also, again, the standard family is uh, way smarter. Then um, what's interesting is that the square meters per house are declining. So it's now around eight square meters. Uh, earlier in 2005, 2015, it was uh, average 90 square meters. So you see that it's declining again, but it's a bit like that. If you see it uh, in the last, since 1850 in the Netherlands, a house is approximately 80 square meters. But what is interesting, if you combine these two numbers, that the idea of, because we think, okay, this compact housing, uh, uh, we are gonna build all these small houses and that's a change in uh, how we, what we do and how we live. But if you see the numbers, then you see that um, uh, the square meters per person are uh, uh, increasing, are growing. So when, where we lived uh, uh, years ago, in, a, in maybe in a bigger apartment, we lived, uh, of average number with more people in it. So now we are living quite small. We live around 38 square meters per person. So this compact housing, it sounds uh, like, oh, this is a time that we have to live smaller and it's uh, set and stuff like that. But if you, you see the numbers, it's maybe not so bad. But uh, this compact living means that you have to design very well. And uh, it also means <coughs> good shared facilities. I will explain a bit more on that. So I have a few uh, compact apartments here to show examples and uh, I think it's nice to go through them a bit. So here you see the outer space is in the middle of the apartment and it's also a connector between the, uh, the, the living room and the, the other living room, the bedroom. Uh, the, uh, yeah, the other living room or sitting room. And the bedroom is in between. And here's the corridor and here's the bathroom and you can close these doors and then you can pass here or you pass here, but you see that we uh, decrease the square meters that are used as a hallway uh, a lot, and we try to use as maximum as possible um, living space. This is a nice example for Peter Martley. I think it's super interesting because this is the, uh, the traffic area, and he designed the uh, eating table as center point of the apartment. There are super smart things in this. So for example, this wall that sticks out a little bit, that gives a bit of privacy if you go to your bedroom or to the bathroom, and also here and also here. And um, I, I, yeah, I think it, if you look at it, it tells a lot already. But these ways are, these things are very interesting to think about. Uh, I think. And here, this is an example from Sweden, <coughs> from Joliar. Yes. They did uh, no traffic space here. They used the kitchen and the, the cupboard where you hang your coat and everything. That's all, the smart furniture part. And only here there's a little traffic area to go to the different bedrooms. And here the bathroom is here. And um, I think there's a lot of privacy in this house. Um, a lot of different spaces. Um, and I think it's also nice that, it's, that the sun is shining through. That you have a lot of light and it also gives a bigger feeling of your house. This is also a quote from um, Glenn Lippens. He says, like, shared facilities can't compensate two small apartments or two small apartments. I will give a few examples of that. I don't know if you just know this uh, building block. It's in Cadix, Antwerp. It's from Search and Bates and um, Bureau Bovenbouw. And there is a communal garden in the middle. Maybe if you look at this, you think, like, yeah, why is this special? Or uh, yeah, you can see that it's a nice architecture. But the smart thing in this is that um, they made uh, houses that are here, they are connected to this garden. And it's a public, a, a private garden, you can only come there if you, if you live in this block. And uh, you can see it also in the floor plan that all the uh, entrances are connected to this garden. So if you come home, you see immediately the garden if you look through. And as I said already, there are people living connected to this garden. And uh, in that way, it, it feels like it's our garden uh, if, you, if you live there. And you see that people use it a lot and they take care for the garden and it's really a used space. And 
uh, Glenn Lewis says, like, in this way, these extra facilities are, are a com compensation for a small house because it's an extra, uh, but it's also a usable extra. And um, I'm always quite um, skeptic about it. For example, you see buildings where there is a shared living room, and then you come there, there is no one sitting because it's, it's yeah, it's like it's something you get in. in um, it's yeah, it's nobody's. It's nobody's and it's like, it feels like, okay, I got a small apartment, but instead of that, I got a shared living room that I don't use. So I think this is a beautiful example of, uh, if you have like a question uh, to, uh, to make a communal um, area, really think well about how to design it, that it's really usable and that it's really an extra. There are different ways to do it. So this is a sketch we made for, uh, for competition. Um, where we say, okay, we can make this uh, entrance area also as a little living room with a little library in it, but also that you see the, the, the shared garden through the window, and you make bicycle parking and stuff uh, close by, so you, it's really in part of this roots, and you bump into this place, and it's an extra space where you can sit or can meet your neighbors. Or, uh, for example, this, this is a plan in Amsterdam, you can also say, like, uh, we have a small apartments with a gallery, but there's a little bench that you can, uh, besides your balcony, you can also use this gallery. So for example, on the balcony you have the evening sun and on your uh, gallery, the gallery, the gallery you, you have the, the morning sun where you have your morning coffee and you say hi to your neighbors. But these are also ways to, um, if you live somewhere and you, you can use this, this little space, it feels a bit more like, okay, this whole building is my home and not only my room. Um, yeah, another point. <laughs> in a storage space. Um, I live in a street in Rotterdam. Um, and uh, I'm always uh, oh yeah, quite surprised. This is also at that time of the year. So, uh, end of, uh, uh, no, at the end of July, there, no, there are a lot of um, small apartments and they are being rented out to international students. And, uh, uh, in Erasmus you have uh, international student students, they come for one semester. And uh, end of July they move out. So you see all these IKEA cupboards being thrown out and on the street, okay, trash being thrown away. And now it's beginning of September and you see all these little vans that are rented. And you see these students with uh, friends or their parents and boxes full of IKEA cupboards. And they are brought into this house and you know already like, oh, in a half a year or a year are thrown away. Now, if you think about all this crisis we are heading, it's super stupid. And then if you think back about this, uh, uh, this uh, apartments from the 1930s, they are quite often building cupboards that are still there and still maybe you have to paint it and uh, uh, that's all you have to do. Now, yeah, I think that kind of things are also things as an architect you can think about and design with and try to convince the clients to, to build those things because they are like lasting for 100 years and it saves a lot of materials and, and it, this kind of, these things they, they sound like maybe for you like stupid little things but they make a lot of um, long term I think they're quite important things to make living a bit better um, and it's also you can also see it from uh, another view that it saves people who live in these apartments a lot of money that you don't have to buy this cupboard so in that way we're also uh, it's very integral um, now, this is another example of a small apartment, but here we thought about how can we do this with all these cupboards. So this is the entrance area, and um, now this was during Corona time, so we thought, okay, it might be nice to use this entrance area also as a little study room. And uh, here uh, we have a cupboard for your coat, and this is like one furniture element. There's a kitchen, and here it becomes a bench with a table. And so on the long uh, side of the apartment, it's all like um, oh yeah, serves area for your house. Also, the major cost is in this, and um, this house is very small. It's 550 square meters, and the, the sketch I showed before is here. So here you see this little bench as an extra to your house from the gallery scene, and here's the balcony. And what I think it's quite nice is that it's a uh, compact apartment, but there's a lot of storage space. There's privacy in it. There are two outdoor spaces, so we really thought like, okay, how can we give the person who got, who's gonna live there the maximum quality? Um, 
Okay, I think this is the last example, then I will stop and then you have it. That's great. You can go from here. <laughs> <laughs> this is a project we are doing in the Life Science Center. I don't know if you know the six S layers of brand. I will explain them shortly. I think it's an interesting principle. It's not about floor plans, but at the end of the award, you know. Um, he, uh, he has, he's talking about six layers, and that means that there are, uh, if you have a building, you can define uh, different parts of the building. So one as is site, one as is skin, one as is structure, um, surfaces, like installations, uh, uh, and interior. And every layer of a building has a certain time uh, that it's that it will last. So, for example, let's say the framework, so that's the structure, can last for 150 years, and also the facade can last for 150 years. Uh, but the interior, that uh, the interior design, if there is a new user, they will want to renew it because uh, they want to have a shiny new office or something like that. So, um, and if you think about these layers, and for example, uh, the interior, if you if we know already on forehead, like, okay, in 10 years, uh, probably they are going to change it. Then you search for the most circular material that's possible, because then if they are going to change this, they, they just, um, no, um, I don't know the word. They just dismantle. 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 They just dismantle. You just dismantle it, and maybe you reuse material. Um, and but, uh, for example, for the installations, we know they last 20 or 25 years. So you make them very easy, replaceable for others, so that you don't, do not have to, de to demolish the whole building because the installations are not good anymore. But you make it easy to get them out and to replace it. And the structure, uh, in this building we make a column structure, because, uh, like for example, in uh, 30 years, um, small apartments are not the thing we need anymore, but we need a lot of big apartments, let's say, or we need more office space, so this apartment has to go out. If you have this column structure, you can change um, easily uh, the walls inside and uh, uh, keep on using the building. And you see that this column structure, here you just, uh, floor plan you don't see too well, but here's a column, here's a column, here's a column, uh, <coughs> you, can, you can see it here where the facade is. It, it, leads to a very interesting floor plans, I think. But if you keep in mind that you can change this, and this is also in this building, we, we have a floor plan that's going to be built now, but we also have a floor plan for in 20 years. If So the what-if scenarios are all sketched. This was all in a tender, that at the moment I quite like to experiment with this kind of thing. Um, but also this kind of things, this flexibility, are very interesting to think about. And, and of course there is... Uh, uh, building in wood. Uh, this is an example uh, of a CLT building. Uh, only these uh, little crosses there are uh, structural, and the other parts are an infill. I think uh, this is also quite an interesting example. But also within the floor plan, it's uh, flexible. So here, this is one apartment, but you can also easily imagine that this is one apartment, or maybe that one day you're you're making it one big apartment at the end of the corridor. There is a lot of change possible within this structure. So also when you're designing uh, floor plans, you can also think like, okay, how can I make it as flexible as possible? Quite often the structure is a key in that. Um, why did I put this in? Yeah, I think for this floor plan, <laughs> <laughs> right, this, this floor plan is also in the, in the building I was just explaining. And what we research also here is that you go for a more uh, public, so where you um, if I, where you have your guests over, where you welcome your guests, you go to more private. So you can also imagine that if you live there as a couple, and your girlfriend has all her friends over chit-chatting, wine, 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 and you want to sleep, you can sleep, and they can use this part of the house, and you have your private area. So also in that way, you can think about flexibility in, your, in the house and in the floor plan. Um, so these were a few examples, uh, just to show that uh, we think as an office that the floor plan is a strong tool for quality of living. Yeah, you can say the most important, but it's good uh, for you all as a student and in the future as an architect or an urbanist that this floor plan is really uh, a strong tool. And uh, you got the pen for it and a way to discuss it. And uh, for example, like Bram is working at the Mons Pen to push all these architects to make good floor plans and uh, I will, I will. think about <laughs> it. 
Uh, yeah, I uh, added a few books. Um, um, might be nice for you to read if you want to dive into the topic more. I think this book is quite nice to read. It's a history of how we live in the Netherlands. Uh, this book, I quite love this, is a different Rotterdam, uh, uh, different Rotterdam building blocks that, uh, that where you really can read these different time periods and what they do. Yeah, yeah. So, I have a few examples. Of course, you can also buy the book. It's not so expensive. I forgot to bring a few. But uh, yeah, there are, uh, these interviews are quite nice to read. And in two weeks, we have an English translation.